I, I just want to tell you all, we've been looking forward to this for 18 months. It's been a while since we've, uh, since we've been together, a little longer time as we move to the fall, and we've been looking forward to it. All of you who are new, we've got an amazing crew of folks who are here, leadership teams from various ministries that are here in addition to the head lead leaders and things. We are so blessed to have you guys with us. We're so blessed that, that we could have the expanded family from our ministries as well as our family families with us. It's just amazing to us. You're going to notice on the name tags, we tried to make things uh, helpful for you, that the ministry name that the group is with is down here at the bottom. And then underneath it, it's going to say either guest that is either A, someone who's just a friend of our Patria family and is joining us, somebody who's in process of becoming part of Patria, somebody who's just sort of a friend of some of you that you brought with you. Uh, that's various groups of people, but it just helps you kind of identify who's who. The second thing it'll say down there is it will say Patria family member. That is typically the lead person from the ministry that's named that is the direct connection to Patria, or one of the leaders from the ministry who is independently connected to Patria. The third thing it'll say down there is the name of that ministry. For example, it'll say North Shore Bridge, and Drew has Patria family member, but Mateo has North Shore Bridge family. That does not mean that Mateo and Audrey are not part of Patria. It means they are part of Patria through Drew and North Shore Bridge, because all of you are part of the family, even our guests, by the way. Because in Greek, Patria literally does mean family, but it means family, tribe, or nation. We are a family of families. That's a tribe. The church and the ministry is a family. The family of families is a tribe, and the kingdom of God is a nation, and we are one. We're all family, so we're glad to have you. I think I covered everything. If I didn't, somebody will remind me of it later. Hallelujah. Let's pray. I, I need to pray before I get started. So announcements and things just sort of stress me out. So thank you, Father. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for, Lord, the things that go right and the things that go wrong, you're here in the midst of all of it. And we just honor you, and we choose to submit to you tonight. God, the words that are spoken, help us to receive and allow to be planted what's from you, to sift out that which is from any of us, and Father, to grow together. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you're in for a treat tomorrow, as I think R.T. is probably, if you've read his book called The Isaac Blessing, I think he's asked permission to speak to that topic. If you haven't read it, you'll maybe be a bit surprised, but you're in for a blessing. Don't turn him off in the first five minutes of his message if he does speak to that. Give him the chance to lay his foundation for it, because it might not be what you expect, but it'll be good. And as I was praying, thinking about what he was bringing and what the Lord had begun to speak to me even before we were able to confirm his being here, the Lord, I just have to tell you, the Lord really dealt with me as we planned this time together. Regard, we had several thoughts on a guest speaker, and I don't remember how many different things we were running through and talking through. And right in the middle of it, all of a sudden, it was like Holy Spirit said, you need to bring RT as the keynote. And we sort of rearranged things and spoke to him. And at the same time, even before he had answered, the Lord began to speak to me, and it came out of observation. And I will say this, nobody please try and figure out who it is, but observation of this family. An observation of this family in which I recognized that we're filled with people who are weary and worn down, some of which are either in or at the brink of burnout, some of which are on their last hurrah of can I make it, 
some of which are at the beginning phases of what in the world is going on, but a full family of people who are strained. If you don't fit that category, I'm not going to actually make you answer this, but if I had to ask, I would say if you don't fit that category, raise your hand, because it would be the minority sitting in here right now. We're in a time and a season in which weariness is the norm. And then when I began to look around, I realized that's not just Patria. This is the state of the church. The church as a whole around the world. You guys, Uganda and Kenya and Slovakia and England, I've talked to you, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the church around the world, everywhere I've gone in the past two years, I've been in 14 countries. The church around the world is in that state. It's, if we're not careful, if we're not aware, we are going to misunderstand what the state we are currently in is about. And we're going to find people who give up and lay down on the brink of revival. And so as I'm watching this and I'm observing these things, Holy Spirit began to speak to me, and all I got from him initially was, I want you to speak to what the current state of the church prophesies. And as I began to ponder it and pray about it, I'm going to be completely honest with you. I, I went through... Lord, I can say a lot about how bad it is. I don't know that I understand what it's prophesying. I'm not sure I know what to tell people. And over the last few weeks, and even up into last night, the Lord just began to speak to me. And he began to open up some understanding for me. And I want to make clear to you something. Nothing I'm going to say tonight do I want you to feel like I am saying, thus says the Lord. I've actually bought into R.T. Kendall's position that saying, thus says the Lord, might very well be taking the name of the Lord in vain. Because when I say, if I say, thus says the Lord, I'm telling you, you should listen to me because I heard from God. We no longer use that phrase to say, God is saying something. We tend to use it to say, you should hear what I'm saying. Because I'm invoking God's name. I'm not saying everybody who does it, does it with that purpose, but we fall into that habit. Okay, so I don't want you to hear me saying, thus says the Lord tonight. I don't want you to hear me saying, I'm prophesying to you something that's coming. I don't want you to hear me saying that I see this happening or this. I'm going to give you observation. If it's from the Lord, glean out of it what you will. And if it's not, spit the bones out. That's my philosophy on what I have to share tonight. Okay? I want to speak to where we are first. And the state of the church. And I want you to see, first, a passage in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 12. I'm going to go there in just a minute. But as I prayed about this, my wife can tell you, I, I literally told her I wanted to bring one of her houseplants down here, and she was afraid I was actually going to do it. And she was going to pack it up for me, but we forgot it. And she has this cool plant. Anybody know what a fiddle fig is? Okay, she has this cool plant. It's a fiddle fig. And it sits in the house, and there's supposed to be a really nice thick trunk but they grow, you know, maybe this high, and they've got great big leaves, and it's supposed to be lush and full of leaves, okay, and, and strong branches. And hers, through no fault of our own, is, well, maybe it is fault of our own, but through not understanding, is like, how long do we have that plant? So four or five years at least, and it's still a little piddling trunk. And it goes up to about two branches or three branches that have a, a leaf or two apiece at most on them. 
and it looks like it's ready to fall over. It's a Charlie Brown tree. Yes. And, and as she began to look into this question of, I'm watering it, I'm giving it plant food, I'm doing, I'm doing all the things you normally do to take care of a plant. She is a plant person. My wife goes to the local home goods, home store, like Lowe's, Home Depot type thing. She goes, and she goes to the rack where the dead plants are that they're selling for 50 cents or a dollar. And she buys all the dead plants. And I think the only thing that happens is that she has to be taking them home and praying for them to be resurrected. Because she brings those things home, and they look pitiful. And within two or three days, she has them like a green thumb person. They just like fill out, and they're beautiful. Those of you who've been to the house before the meeting, some of you that came in early, she had a backyard full of these dead plants she brought home that she had brought to this beautiful life and these beautiful flowers. And about two nights before anybody dropped by, the deer came in the yard and ate everything. Uh, so it was beautiful. The deer wanted to eat it. They thought it was great. But yeah, dessert. So she takes these dead and dying plants, and she just resurrects them. I mean, she's amazing with it. But this poor fiddle fig... Let me just say, it was bad shape. Anybody have a fiddle fig and know why it was in bad shape? I'll tell you why it was in bad shape. Because a fiddle fig, in order to be strong, requires every day for you to go to that inside house plant and take it by its trunk and shake it. And if you don't shake that plant every day or two, it will never grow a strong trunk. And it won't fill out full of leaves. Now, if you search the internet, you're going to find that a whole group of people say, I'm telling you the absolute truth, and a few people are going to say, that's crazy. But that's the consensus among plant people. And it bears fruit in that when you see these fiddle figs that people are shaking every day, they have good thick trunks and lots of leaves. The healthy fiddle fig has to be shaken in order to be strong. We're my wife's fiddle fig right now as the church because we have done everything within our power. I'm not speaking to us. Well, I am speaking to us too. I'm just going to be honest. I'm speaking to all of us in the room. But I'm speaking to the church as a whole. We're fiddle figs that haven't been shaken. Why? Because we have done everything in our power, particularly the church in America, to declare, prophesy, speak forth in faith, that we will not be shaken. We're going to overcome. The enemy's not going to beat us up. And in so doing, we have refused to allow the Lord to come by every day and shake our trunk. And we've become weak. And we wonder why we're about to give up and why we're weary and why so many people are in burnout and why so many are, are just ready to give in. And we look around us and we justify it by saying, well, you've got all those people who live their hidden lives and God is dealing with them. He's exposing sin in the church. No, they just got shaken and they had a bunch of stuff that should have been shaken off a long time ago and they didn't let their self get shaken. Is he exposing sin? Yeah, he's exposing sin. But bottom line is all he's really doing is shaking and gross stuff that should have never grown on their tree is shaken off now to strengthen the church. When if it had been shaken off years ago, we wouldn't be hearing the stories about them today. Now, just on that alone, I want to ask you, do you want to be my wife's fiddle fig or a healthy fiddle fig? Because that's the choice we're presented with right now. We're presented with, are we going to fight being shaken? Or are we going to embrace being shaken? Because the enemy is not the one shaking the church right now. God is shaking his church. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 26 and 27. At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised, 
Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase. Now, the writer of Hebrews decides he better explain this to you. By saying yet once more, he says, I'm not sure you're going to get this. You've experienced shaking in the past. You're going to be shaken again. And I want you to understand that when I say you're going to be shaken again, it's because of something. And this phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. You're getting shaken more than once because God is not going to let stuff stay on the tree that's not supposed to be on the tree. That is, things that have been made in order that things cannot be shaken may remain. What is he saying there? Everything in your life as a leader that you have positioned to put yourself in a place where you can be recognized and received as a leader, the things you have made is going to be shaken off. So that nothing that cannot be shaken, what God has put within you, will fall off only the stuff you made. And you're going to be left unshakable. We saw in 2020 the effects of a worldwide pandemic. Doesn't matter. Listen, we're good about accepting different people's perspectives in this family. I don't care whether you believe it was a pandemic or you don't. Doesn't matter. We saw the effects of either a real pandemic or what was presented as a pandemic. Okay, so I, want you, I don't want us to have miss see something because we disagree on what happened. Okay. We saw the effects of what was presented to us or was real as a worldwide pandemic. And we thought, we got through that. The church barely made it. People are finally starting to come back. And we are not ready for the next one. Because we really didn't let anything get shaken off. We just endured hoping things would go back to the way they were. And we don't need to go back to the way they were. The Lord is going to shake off everything that can be shaken so that nothing that cannot be shaken, nothing except that which cannot be shaken remains. I don't have to prophesy to you for you to know that what I'm about to say is true. COVID-19 is not the last major world crisis we're going to see in the next few years. The Israeli-Hamas war is not the last major crisis we're going to see in the world in the next few years. The Ukrainian-Russian war is not the last major crisis we're going to see in the next few years. Trump versus Harris is not the last major crisis we're going to see in the world in the next few years. In fact, none of those things, and by the way, other than what I've said now, politics is off limits this weekend. None of that stuff matters. If God is in charge. But if you're not secure in having been shaken to the point that you have nothing left except what can't be shaken, all of those things are going to keep spiraling you downward. Every one of them. Because it doesn't matter which one, eventually one's going to come off around that doesn't turn out the way you thought it should. And it doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong. One of them's going to turn out the way you did that the way you didn't think it should, whether you were right or wrong, and you're going to be in crisis. Why? Because God is positioning His church to not be shakable. You cannot run to solid ground if there's no solid ground to run to. If all the earth is sinking sand. And there's no solid rock on which any of his church is standing. That is a hymn, isn't it, Sean? Yeah. All of the ground is sinking sand. You don't want to hear me sing. <laughs> if, if God is not positioned his church to be visible, standing upon unshakable ground, there is nowhere for the world to run. And we have been satisfied with moderately stable quicksand. It's just where we are. 
say, yeah, but it's all the stuff that the enemy's doing. I'm telling you, the enemy is not doing this. Is there stuff the enemy's doing? Yes, I understand that. Don't hear me wrong. Is there stuff the enemy is attacking the church with? Yes, I understand that. Last time I checked, God in heaven is sovereign. And everything the enemy did in Scripture, he went to God and asked permission to do first. And if we're seeing worldwide attack of the enemy, I promise you, it has not come without Satan going into the courts of heaven and saying, God, I want permission to test them in this way. And the Lord God saying, go get them. Look at Peter. That's effectively what Satan did with Peter. Jesus said, the enemy is asked to sift you, Peter. And if you really want to just bring it down to, to, to North Alabama redneck language, God responded to Satan, sick him. Go get him. Why? If you, you know the story of Peter, why did God say that? Because he knew that when Peter had been through that testing, he would be a different person from what he was before he went through it. And what Peter was about to experience would require him to be a different person from what he had been. Many of you have heard John Paul Jackson speak some things that have always been an encouragement and a strength to me. There's a couple of st phrases John Paul used to use that have sustained me for years. And you'll recognize two of them. And the Lord has added one into my heart, on, built on the, the foundation of what John Paul used to say. He used to say this. He would say, the depth of your valley, what? Prophesies the height of your mountaintop. And then he would say, the length of your valley prophesies your sphere of influence. And I want to add something to you. Your presence in the valley prophesies your ability to stand on the mountaintop. We believe, and this is a lie I believe from the enemy, we believe as a church that it is our mountaintop experiences that sustain us in our valleys. I do not believe that. I believe our valleys keep us from doing stupid stuff on the mountaintop. Because I'm much more afraid of doing something stupid on the mountaintop and being judged by my God than I am about spending time in a valley. So what are we dealing with? My father used to teach <clears throat> on, a, on what he would call baptism of fire. And he would speak to the idea that we're tested by fire to prepare us for what's next. Uh, John Paul and many others, uh, John Sanford, several would talk about a couple of things called the um, uh, dark night of the soul. Some of, most of you probably heard that. That actually originated with a guy named St. John of the Cross. And it speaks to a time when your gifts begin to fail and you have to trust God because the way you used to do things don't work, it doesn't work anymore. Then John Paul would speak to, and all of you as believers are going to go through dark nights of the soul. It's just because God is going to make you dependent upon him. Every time you think you can accomplish it yourself, God is going to remove the ability for what you thought would work to work so that you have to go back to him to learn how he wants it to work. Then there was a thing called the dark night of the spirit. Some of you, some of you say, I haven't even heard of that one. Dark night of the spirit is not something everybody goes through. You're chosen to go through it because he expects that we will be ready to quit in the dark night of the spirit. That not only does the way it used to work not work anymore, but everything starts to go wrong. The reward of dark night of the Spirit is you're granted authority to be transformational. I don't care what we call it. Baptism of fire, dark night of the soul, dark night of the Spirit. They all have a purpose. They're to prepare us for what's next. And if we get consumed with looking at where we are instead of looking for where we're going, those things will kill us. And it, they're killing people around you. 
If we begin to recognize that those things are not going to kill us, they are prophesying our destiny, I'm not going to say we're going to be happy about it, but we will begin to embrace them. James says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. We know this verse. A lot of you have it memorized. You don't believe it, but you know it. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing the testing of your faith produces patience. And when patience has had its perfect work, you'll be whole and complete and lacking nothing. How many of us have joyfully embraced our trials to the point we're whole and complete and lacking nothing? I haven't. Very difficult to do. I do not want you to hear me saying this is a joyous message. I'm just trying to be real about where we are as a church. I don't want a lot of people to end up burnt out because they're in the sta early stages of burnout. I don't want people to quit when they're on the brink of victory. I don't want people to fail when God is offering success. But if we don't understand what we're going through, it's really easy to get overwhelmed and not hang on. You heard that old phrase, when you get to the end of the rope, tie a knot in it and hang on for dear life. And that's where some of us are at. I know it's not everybody, but it's enough of you, it's important to talk about. So what's happening? I'm going to talk about it from the perspective of baptism of fire. Okay? We could use any of the other phrases in different ways, but I'm going to talk about it from the perspective of baptism of fire because I want you to see it. If we look at the scripture in Luke chapter 3, verse 16, interestingly, the very chapter and verse should tell us this is an important passage. Why? What's well, one of the most important passages in the Bible to us as believers? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Its counterpart is Luke 3.16. And Luke 3.16 says, John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And then we just ignore it. And fire. I want us to think for a minute scripturally what fire is for. Okay? Because all of us embrace baptism in the Holy Spirit. Well, at least I think most of us do. At some level or another, I believe everybody in this room has embraced the idea of salvation, John 3.16, and the first half of Luke 3.16, that is being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not just with the evidence of speaking tongues, but Acts 1.8 says with the evidence of power. But we don't embrace the second part of Luke 3.16, which is and fire. So what does it mean? According to Hebrews 12, we read 26 and 27 earlier. Remember, it said that everything that can be shaken will be shaken effectively. That's where we get that phrase. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. So Hebrews 12, verse 26 and 27 talks about the only thing that's going to remain is that which can't be shaken. And verse 28 goes on to say this. Therefore, let us be grateful... Receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. We are to be recipients of not what is our own, but a kingdom that cannot be shaken. By the way, just so you understand this concept, when will the end come? When the gospel is preached to every nation, right? Wrong. That's not when the end comes. It's not what the passage says. That passage says... When the gospel, when this gospel of the kingdom is preached to every nation, and then the end will come. And we are to receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken. I don't think the church has presented a gospel of a kingdom that can't be shaken. We think we're really close to Jesus coming back. I don't know that I believe that. Could it change tomorrow and him come back tomorrow? Could him come back tonight? I have to be prepared for that. I pray in some ways for that, and in some ways I pray it's not the case. Because I am a believer. 
that I don't want Jesus to come back till some of my friends get born again. And if I keep saying, come quickly, Lord Jesus, I'm going to have some people who end up in hell that I love. So maybe I should be praying, Lord Jesus, hold on till I can reach one more person. That might be a better prayer. Hold on till an unshakable kingdom has been presented and people cannot deny its power. And they cannot reject you without choosing to say, I'm not having it. Receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Why has verse 26, 27, and verse 28 up to this point been written? For, this means, this is why I've been telling you this, our God is what? A consuming fire. A consuming fire. Now, we got two choices on that word consuming. Practically speaking, consuming has two potential meanings. Consuming can speak to the idea that it is going to use me up and destroy me, consume me like a fire consumes the wood that's in it and uses all of its energy and leaves nothing but burn up ash. Or consuming can be something that means to fully absorb like we eat food. And it is consumed. It becomes a part of who we are. Fully absorb. The attention in one way of someone or something. So you got two choices. Our God of consuming fire is either going to burn you up and leave you with nothing left but ash, or he is going to make you such a part of him that there's no ability to distinguish you from him. That's really the only two choices. That's who he is. So we either get one of two scriptural results if he's a consuming fire. We get either the result of Luke 3.16 in which he baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. He immerses us into himself with the Holy Spirit and fire. We are fully absorbed into the consuming fire of God, becoming a part of who he is. We either get that, and I'll come back to that in just a minute, or we get Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy 4, 23 and 24 says it this way. This is where I'm afraid a whole lot of the church is, and it's where I'm afraid very much of the Western world is, and a fair amount of the rest of the world. Take care, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you. Take care lest you forget that covenant, and instead of the covenant, you make yourself a carved image, the form of anything that the Lord your God has forbidden you. I'm not going to mention the various things I think have become idols around us today, but we already mentioned a few of them. You figure that out for yourself, because I said we're not talking about it anymore. The Lord our God does not want us focused on the things of man. He does not want us think, focused on the secular systems. He does not want us focused on the way it's always been done. He says, don't do those things. He says, focus on his kingdom. The end's not coming till the kingdom gospel has been preached. We're to be empowered to represent the kingdom as ambassadors. I mean, just over and over again in Scripture. We're to be focused on the kingdom. And anything that we are forbidden or given not to focus on, that we put our attention on, becomes a graven image, an idol. And if we forget our covenant and focus on all the other stuff, including our pain and suffering... The Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. And if we forget our covenant and focus in the wrong direction and create idols of all this other stuff around us, 
then we get consumed as in burn up and left as ash. But if we don't forget our covenant, we're baptized. Not just for salvation, not just in the Holy Spirit, but into the consuming fire. Now let's stop there for a minute. The word baptized. We need to decide what it means first. The word there is baptizo. It is not bapto. That's easily confused because they sound very much alike. And if you're, unless you're focused on Greek and Hebrew, you can say oh, it's probably the same thing. It's not. It's very specifically the word is baptizo. That word, the best way to explain it means to dip, immerse, or submerge, as in a vessel being submerged into the water and being completely immersed in it. To cleanse by dipping, submerging, washing, to make clean, or to overwhelm. Yep. Yes, I will. And I'll come here. It means to dip repeatedly, to immerse, to submerge, as in a vessel completely submerged in water. To cleanse by dipping or submersing, to wash and make clean, to, to bathe or clean, or to overwhelm. Basically, the heart of it is to be fully immersed into something. That's the heart of that word. Yes, I'm about to talk about that. Okay. Yep. The best way to distinguish baptizo from bapto is the pickle process. And the ancient Greek recipes for pickles use both words. Okay? They are both baptoed and baptizoed. The cucumber has to go through both processes. If they are simply baptoed, it basically means you dip the pickle into boiling water and there is a temporary touch of the water on the pickle. It basically it scalds it and it prepares it for something. If you baptizo the pickle, it means that the pickle is going to be immersed into a vinegar solution that changes it forever into something else. The cucumber is baptoed and it gets a temporary change that makes it ready for something. It, it, it is baptizoed and it permanently changes into a pickle. It absorbs that which is around it to become more like what was around it than what it was before it went in. You have been called... To be baptized into salvation, that's water baptism. It, we understand it's an evidence of salvation. It is a picture of salvation. You've been called to that. We get that. We're fine with that. Most of you believe in walking in power. Probably most of you speak in tongues. One of the evidences of being baptized with the Holy Spirit. But I think everybody in here would agree. We agree that we are supposed to be people of power and authority. That is the primary evidence of baptism in the Holy Spirit. I don't have time to explain that. If you have a differing belief, I don't mind that. There's just some pretty good scriptural evidence that says tongues is not the evidence. It is an evidence. Uh, it's a good enough one if that's what you believe, so I'm okay with it. We believe that. But very few of us ever even deal with being baptized in fire. To be fully immersed into the consuming nature of God until we are transformed in such a way that we are no longer anything like what we were, but we're a completely different person. And the shaking and fire in Hebrews are side by side. Fire is either going to consume you by destroying you or it's going to consume you by changing you. 
And I am of absolute belief that you cannot be baptized in the Holy Spirit without ultimately being baptized in fire. Because the two are not separated. We have spent most of our Christian lives being satisfied with baptism in the Holy Spirit because we were afraid to be baptized in fire. And we only got half of the promise. And then we want to see all of the promises. Why does the church not have power? We didn't complete the process. We just got baptized. We didn't get baptized. It does sound pretty funny, doesn't it? We got dipped. We didn't get immersed in. And I don't care what your philosophy is about water baptism. We're talking about something more spiritual here. We stuck our toe in for a minute and said, ah, oh, the water's fine. But then we didn't get in. And Holy Spirit is not satisfied with half a commitment. He's, he's allowed it for a long time. But he's not satisfied with that. He wants to transform us. And so what he's doing is he is shaking. And he is prepping us. Now, I think we got two choices. We embrace it as hard as it is, or we fight it. And I think that leads to two other issues. I think we then get either Malachi 3 or Isaiah 48. Malachi 3 is when we resist the fire of God. I'm sorry. Um, hang on, where is it? Yeah, Malachi 3 is when we resist the fire of God. Behold, I send, visit this verse 1 through 3. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like the fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. He will put us in there, and he will pull the dross off the top, we'll like it or not. I think we can submit to the process, and we get Isaiah 48. Isaiah 48 says this, Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. What's the difference? Remember this idea of baptiz, bab, babto and baptizo. I'm willing to check it out. We get Malachi. He will remove the dross, and he will make you a vessel of righteousness, but you're not going to have a lot of authority because he's just pulled the dross off of you. You're still just a piece of silver. But I submit to him, I baptizo. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. Now, all of us are going to say, but I, I don't, don't want that. I don't want to be tried in the furnace of affliction. Back up and look at the Hebrew, what he's actually saying. I have chosen you because you went into the furnace of affliction. Now, we'd like to be chosen, but we don't want the furnace of affliction in order to get there. That's Isaiah 48.10. It's always been there for us, and if you're a part of streams, if you've been a part of streams and around John Paul, in the art of hearing God, you heard this scripture over and over again. It's Hosea. Chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Therefore, I will allure her, speaking to Israel. I will bring her into the wilderness, and I will speak tenderly to her. And we recognize it's talking about Israel, but it's speaking to us. And there I will give her vineyards and make the valley of Accor, the valley of death. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
That doesn't have anything to do, I, if I ever happen to be in a place that's close to death, God's going to be with me, that says you are going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And when you're there, I'm with you. I will give to her the valley of Accor, the valley of death, the valley of no way out, the valley of dead ends. If you don't know what Accor was, it's the place where Achan was killed for the sin that he committed that led to the loss at I. AI, but if I say AI, then everybody thinks it's artificial intelligence. <laughs> we had this conversation earlier today. I, and I will make the valley of Accor a door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth and at the time when she came out of the land of Israel, of Egypt, I mean, into freedom. This is what the Lord wants for us. Where you are right now, for many of you, is not the end. It's not burnout. It is weary. I understand that. It is tiring. I get that. But it is prophesying to you authority and transformation. It is prophesying to you revival. And I was looking at this. I'm going to try and wrap up here just from a time state sake. But I was looking at this, and I looked at this principle in marketing. And there's a principle in marketing called um, innovators, early adapters, early majority, late majority, and laggards. And the idea is that there's certain people who are in an inner circle, and they recognize when something new is about to come on the scene, and they become an innovator. They present it to others and say it's worth it. It's what we in the church would call forerunners. So you're seeing some people around you now, and I don't have time to go through the whole process, but if you go back and read John Paul Jackson's prophecy on the fourth row, you're seeing some people beginning to step to the fourth row, paying a price and beginning to step there. And they're not national names. They're nameless and faceless people because they're saying it's worth the price. And we're moving towards the early adapters phase. The place where people are going to say, I think I believe that. If I get in on this early on, I can make a fortune. Or to put it in church terms is, they got something there. If I can grasp that, I can walk in the authority and power I've been promised. We're not close to the early majority yet. That's when it becomes normal. It's the way the church survives. It's the way things are supposed to look. And the late majority, we're already moving towards, that's the people who've just decided it's tradition and it works, so I do it not for the sake of what God is doing, but because it's what we're supposed to do. And then finally, the laggards are, it's the way it's always been done. Might as well try it. And that doesn't bring the power. I want to be in the innovator and early adapter place of this concept because I believe with all my heart the Lord is about to release a wave of revival in this nation. He is about to move people who were nameless and faceless to the fourth row. He's about to put them into a place to be facilitators of revival. But revival is not going to look the way we expect it. We are not going to see a Toronto. We're not going to see a Brownsville. For good or bad, we're not going to see a Lakeland. We're not going to see a named evangelist with a big church or venue that everybody runs to. Because the truth is, the world will no longer run there anymore. The world is sick of the church, and they are not going to run to anybody's church. All we're going to do if we have a big venue where hundreds of people show up is get the people who are about to be saved anyway, who their friend brought them to get saved there, so it was a good feel-good experience. That's all we're going to get. So what are we going to see? People who have been through the baptism of fire, people who have been through the shaking, we are a remnant 
who the weight and the pressure of what the Lord has allowed, I know some people won't like the way I say this, but it's just truth. The Lord has allowed the enemy to put on you. The weight that's crushing you right now. If you build the pressure in a pressure cooker long enough, what happens? It explodes and everything that was in it splatters across everybody around it. Now that can be a very negative thing, so understand my analogy is not perfect, right? <laughs> Pieces of the pressure cooker go through somebody's arm and it's probably not a great thing. But the stew that was in it gets on everybody at the same time, okay? So this weight and pressure that's been on everyone... When it breaks, when we reach that point we would call breakthrough, we begin to push it back. And the light of God that is within us explodes from us. And we don't become the next Billy Graham. We become John Doe at such and such company. And the sphere of influence around us gets transformed because the atmosphere is different because we're there. Amen. That's revival. Yep. And when you take 12 people, 3,000 people, 30,000 people, 300,000 people, and they begin to let the light of God that's in them that maybe my sphere of influence only gets out this far. But these two are transformed by it. And as they move to where they go, their light begins to touch people. Maybe my sphere of influence covers this whole section. Maybe it covers the whole room. Doesn't matter. It's not about how many I reach. It's about that my, what I carry is used to the fullest of what God put it in me for. I hear people say, there's just so many people who can do what I do better than me. When you've been through the baptism of fire, when you've been through the dark night of the soul, when you've been through the dark night of the spirit, when you've been through that pressure cooker and you break through, nobody can do what you do the way God created you to do it. That's right. Who knows the name of the person who led Billy Graham to Jesus? I did know, and I forgot it. What's his name? I can't think. Sunday. Billy Sunday. It was actually a different guy that uh, Billy Sunday led him in some things, and nobody even knows his name. If you look on the Internet, you'll find it. It's uh, Mordecai. Mordecai Ham. That's it. Mordecai Ham. Thank you very much. What's that? Yeah, Mordecai Ham. Nobody knows his name. Yeah. Because his sphere of influence was to touch a few people, and Billy Graham happened to be one of them. You know what's cool about that? Mordecai Ham gets the same reward Billy Graham does. Because the, the generation of nameless and faceless aren't worried about filling a stadium. They're worried about touching the life that's in front of them right now. That's revival. What is the state of weariness that you're facing prophesying? What is the state of burnout that the church is facing prophesying? What is the challenge the pressure cookers that's going on around us prophesying? It's prophesying that you're on the brink of breakthrough that will transform the community around you. But it's not fun. And I dare you to find me a scripture that supports the idea that being a Christian is supposed to be fun. Is it joyous? Yes. Is it fun? It depends on your definition, but usually not. It's usually joy that we think of as fun. Because joy is a choice that is responded to by God Fun is something that the atmosphere around us just throws on us and we have a good time. You can challenge my definitions if you want to, but for sake of right now, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. 
Walk in joy, but don't expect it to be fun. If we walk through it long enough, will it become fun? That I will agree with. I want to see revival, but it's not the revival we've been expecting. And there's going to be a price to pay. If we don't pay the price, we're not going to see the revival. One of the last, among the last few really true great revivals was the Welsh Revival. Ask Steve Watson sometime what he learned about the Welsh Revival. But one thing I can tell you about it is there was a heavy price paid by the people who ushered it in. Was it worth the price? I'd say it was. I could keep on, I could point you to so many other things, things like Philip and the fact that we don't always get to know the impact of having paid the price. Sometimes it's hidden to us. Philip had a great revival, had to leave it, go to the desert, talk to one guy, and then disappears from Scripture. Probably never knew that the one guy he talked to changed the nation. Probably never knew it. I could, just, I could just keep going, but for sake of time, I'm not, because I don't want to wear you out. Worse than some of you already are. I want you to embrace where you are and recognize the price is worth it. Hold on. Amen. The Lord has promised not to test you, not to let you be tempted or tested beyond what you can endure. He made a promise. You're going to make it. And you're going to see the fruit of revival around you if you do. All right, I'm going to pray for you. Then we'll eat s'mores. Have some fun. <laughs> Father. Hang on. I, Lord, just remind me i got to say this. I'm not asking for any kind of response to this. I'm not suggesting that anyone should respond in some way to this. But the Lord very clearly told me to prepare and be ready to baptize tomorrow. And that was before we thought that one of the young people might like to be baptized. As a result of that, I have to say this to you. Baptism in water is always symbolic. It can be a picture of your salvation, or it could be a picture of embracing baptism of fire, for example. It could be a picture of saying, I want to be refreshed. I'm tired. I need to be cleaned up and prepared for something new. So I want to say this to you. If the Lord stirs you and you would like to express a response to this concept through Baptism in water, I'm not a believer. It only represents salvation moments. I happen to be a believer, and it can mark significant moments in our life. So if that applies to you and the Lord stirs that in you, I'm prepared to baptize people tomorrow, just so you know. You can talk to me if that applies. Now I'll pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, will you strengthen the weary? Will you uphold the tired? Will you defend the worn out? Will you renew the burnt out? Will you pour out your spirit? And even in the midst of fire, consume us by being immersed into who you are and not burnt up by who you are. Change us like that pickle, God. Transform us that we're never the same as we walk through the fire and through the flood. And we stop trying to bypass it, but we endure it and overcome. Father, pour out fire. You don't have to receive this, by the way. But if you do, then receive it. Pour out fire that changes those in this room into who you created them to be permanently. In Jesus' name, amen.